Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a lavish conversation featuring Jen Small. Hi, Hi. Jen. Hey, everybody. It's me. I'm here. <laughs> thank Being you lavish. so much for joining us. You look beautiful as always. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Shout yeah. out to Daily and Mark H2 Salon for getting the color together today. <laughs> yes, you look lovely. Definitely. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. so I know we're catching you after work, which is, you know, and on a Friday, which I know is one of your most busy times, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so I really appreciate my, you My doing plans this. had changed, unfortunately, or fortunately, it's for a good reason. My plans had changed since we agreed to this time. So, you know, I def I didn't, I'm a person of my word. I didn't want to like change on you, but I, I have some other commitments that I have to take care of this evening. Well, I appreciate you for taking the time. Definitely. I want to say welcome to everyone joining us live. You know, as people join in, we'll give the, you know, they'll catch up and then people can always catch the playback. So thank you everybody for watching the playback as well. Lavish conversations are just conversations with inspiring people about why existing is not enough. And I had the pleasure of meeting this wonderful light who is Jen Small. I mean, she's packed in a small package, which is very interesting, but she definitely holds a huge light that bursts from her just without her control in all honesty. So to know her is to see and recognize that within oh. her. And I think she has a very interesting perspective on our whole, you know, not just existing, but living um, efforts and you know initiatives because your living is not necessarily being a singer or an actress or something like that you definitely mix the corporate with the you know entrepreneurial and yes. so I, I think that's very a good place to start so if you want to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself yeah sorry and our apologies if it's a bit loud in my background i'm leaving okay, well, okay great so um, I'm Jen Small. I am from Brooklyn. I am from Brooklyn uh, originally, but uh, by way of Barbados. So my family's from Barbados, but I went to Barbados for the first time when I was six months old. I spent time there and I visited there every summer uh, growing up sometimes two, three times a year. My mom was very much um, intentional about making sure that I stayed a part of like our culture. Um, so that for me was a blessing because I was a world traveler at the age of two. I had went to London for the first time. We have a very international family, uh, fortunately. Um, so I've had those blessings. Um, and I think, you know, just in life, um, a lot of people try to force duality onto us, um, or excuse me, try to force like being in a box onto us, but I've been fortunate to live in duality. Like I was an artist or I, at five years old, I was taking art classes and my mom saw that talent in me and she allowed me to develop it, which is something that most Caribbean households don't always appreciate. And then I also, um, you know, I, I joke around, uh, my mom thinks I should still go to law school at this point in my life, but I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, and when I was a little kid, someone, we had a homework assignment in fourth grade, I still remember. Fourth grade, our teacher said to us, like, interview someone who does what you want to be when you grow up. And so because my family had bought the house that I now own, um, that I had to move back to, to purchase, um, when I was five, we had a family attorney. And so I interviewed Mr. Wright. And he was just like, you know, you'll make a good lawyer. You just have to love to read, read, read. And I was just like, I just started like Homer Simpson into the hedges, like reading. Ooh. I read because I have to. Like, can I tell you, I love to read. Like, I'm not one of those people who curls up on a couch with a book. I do that and I fall asleep. Right. So in, in fourth grade, I was just like, dang, let me just start doing math. <laughs> so then I, I got really good at math. Uh, I had a little struggle with it in seventh grade. But in high school, I was like, you know, Regent Scholar, um, graduated with a Regent Diploma, like, you know, 90s on plus or on all of my math regences. And at 16, I had the opportunity to get my first internship in corporate America um, with Silence with Barney, which is now today's Citigroup. So my finance experience started, you know, a little over 20 years ago um, in 2001 when I was at the tender age of 16. I was a compliance intern. I was reviewing people's um, 
for anybody who's in finance, you'll know you have to get like registrations, which is like series seven, series 63. And so at that time, I used to have to review when people's registrations were expiring and send them emails at 16, like, hey, you know, the, um, just I'm from the compliance department, your registration is expiring, you need to do your continuing education. And so that was my first experience. And then the following summer, uh, I worked with a woman by the name of Laverne Mitchell, who I took her on to be my mentor because I was in a mentoring program, but my mentor left uh, Solomon at the time. So I was mentorless um, and Laverne was my manager and she was one of those like, you know, no nonsense black ladies who was just like, y'all need to dress like this. And you know, like she's, uh, she's very polished, but like, I just remember being like afraid, like my first like orientation, like, oh my God, this lady was so hard. And then I find out the next week she was actually my manager. <laughs> um, oh, but <laughs> yeah, it's like at the fate of the odds of that, it's like the, the hard black lady from the orientation became my manager, but a godsend because she just wanted to make sure that we were polished and that we, you know, not just being kids from the inner city who people look down on. Like she wanted to make sure that we could hold our own in corporate America. And that laid the foundation for me. I'm still in touch with Laverne to this day. Like I saw her over the summer in Martha's Vineyard. She has a home out there. Um, and she's just like, exactly. She's just like black finance goal. She's left the industry, but um, she's an educator now. And again, with the, the duality, like the fact that she was able to leave a finance career and still do something else and still find ways to educate herself and to give back to her community and her church. And, you know, she's a very much an inspiration to me. Um, and then fast forward to, you know, I, I stepped away from finance for a little bit. My dad was sick. Um, and, you know, it was one of those things where I felt like I was starting to just exist. So to your theme of why existing is not enough, I would wake up in the morning and I was just like, oh, God, I don't want to go to work. Like, I got to figure out appointments to take my dad to the doctor or, you know, my mom also was having health issues. So it was just like trying to balance that all. And I just. Isn't it crazy how life, you know, can be just going along, you know, no issues and suddenly something shakes up and it's all it, it generally seems like the common theme is something like illness or a loss or just something sudden like a true you know shake up in your life that make that forces you to stop and re and reevaluate it forces you to change perspectives or change your operating stance so, absolutely absolutely yeah. so that was the the my dad the job um, I had previously worked at Goldman um, when I lived in London, and it was an existing period as well where I would wake up in the morning, I would throw up sometimes, like my stomach was messed up, and I didn't know that, that was, I had anxiety is right. basically what I figured out. And so um, the doctor on site basically like signed me off of work. Like she was just like, you need to go home, like you should see a therapist. And that's like when I first started going to therapy for the first time, that was in uh, 2012. Um, and I just remember like saying to my therapist, like, I'm not suicidal. I would never want to kill myself. But like, if I could get hit by like a bus or something that would allow me to not have to go to work, that would be like a really good place for me. Like I wouldn't his, yeah. his mouth just like hit the floor. And that's when I knew that like everything was not okay. Like I was just like, oh my God, like the way this man looked at me and he signed me off for work. So the, the doctor at work was like, you need a couple of weeks off. He signed me off for work for three months. I had to go to therapy like twice a week. And it was just such a amazing experience. Like, you know, therapy is like dating. Like everybody's not going to be the first person. It's not always going to work right away. But with I'm him, it, did. it was it was a great experience. I'm happy that I did it. And it's something that like I was able to pull tools from for later in my life. Like going to therapy made me realize like you could be comfortable in your silence. You could be comfortable being alone. Like I would, I have a lot of friends. I mean, I grew up as an only child. I do have siblings, but you know, like my mom, I'm my mother's only child. So I grew up as an only child and I was, I had a million cousins. So it's just like, anytime there was like parties or things like I always had a plus one I always had a plus five like we were a whole little crew like people thought my mom had like six kids but it was really just me and um, all of my cousins, and all the cousins. Um, so it was one of those things where 
I just had never really realized that I was not comfortable doing things on my own because I literally had a twin cousin. Like I grew up with someone who we look similar. We used to be in all the weddings together. Like we were the number one flower girls in Brooklyn from 90, from 1990. Yeah. I feel like from 89 to 95, I was in everyone's wedding with my twin cousin, right? Crystal, <laughs> shout out to her. I don't know if she's watching, but so the, like I literally going to therapy, like I remember saying to my therapist, like, you know, I want to see a movie, but my friends are all working right now. And he was just like, go by yourself. And I was like, what? Go to the movies by myself? And then I did it. And it was just like, oh, it's so liberating to do things on your own. Like, to the point where now, like, I travel on my own. Like, I'm going to Bermuda for my birthday. And I do have a friend who lives there. And I'm going to go to an event she's doing. But, like, it doesn't matter. Like, I've been to Puerto Rico by myself. been to Bermuda before by myself. Like, it's just finding that power in being able to do things where you you don't need anyone else is like a good, but it's also a scary place to be. Cause it like, is I, so when scary. It's, when I it's first scary at times. Cause it's like, out alone like that. Yeah. <laughs> when you're was, comfortable being alone, it, it's, it's amazing. But the scary part is like, I want to get married. I want to have a family, but it's just like so easy to not like, deal with someone else sometimes it's just like oh he's messing up today oh i'm out (laughs) you know like i definitely understand that but i compare it to like snorkeling so um snorkeling to me is like so beautiful all of a sudden you'll look up and you'll there'll be fish everywhere like all different types and you're like this is so amazing this is so beautiful and then this thought comes into the back of your head like what if they all just attack right now you know what I mean? <laughs> and you're, like, what's so the you, worst that could happen right exactly, now? Exactly, exactly. But if you let that little teeny fear keep you from going out there in the first place, you'll never see or experience that beauty, you know? No, it's, it's absolutely. And why it's funny you bring up snorkeling. My brother, sister-in-law, my sister and my brother-in-law, they could tell you this was my first time going snorkeling this summer when we went to Barbados because... I would let the fear paralyze me. Like I know how to swim. I used to take swim. I used to go to swim camp Mm -hmm. um, every, every other summer. Like if I didn't go to Barbados, like we, my family would send us to Florida and I would take swimming lessons and I was in a swimming camp, but I almost drowned at think Mm -hmm. at like seven or eight. So I have, I didn't know this until I became an adult. I have PTSD. So if like water runs over like my eyes, especially, Mm -hmm. I just feel like, (gasps) And I start hyperventilating, um, but I was able to like calm myself enough to actually go snorkeling. And then in the new year, I'm planning to take uh, some swimming lessons with some friends um, just to like make sure that, you know, I may even get hypnotized. Like I've, I've talked about that too, potentially, but right. um, I mean, just but to get past the fear. I, I want to yeah. not live in fear of doing things, uh, especially like I love the really ocean. Good. Yeah, exactly. That's Listen. existing. Like I would be existing, not going out into like the deep sea to swim or whatever. And it's just like, we, we honestly all know how to swim. It's just an innate ability to mammals, but right. it's fear that takes over that stops us from doing these things. And so I try not to move from a place of fear. I move in a place of faith because right. um, God works everything out. It doesn't matter like what the, the obstacle is. I always get through it, right? And that brings me back to your time when you left when you left corporate America. Oh yeah, because I didn't have a job. I literally was like, I am out of here. Like I had no job lined up. I said to my mom, like, so the joke is like the you know the relationship changes. So it went from her being the parent to me being the parent. And so my mom gets anything she wants. It's just like, hey, order this off of Amazon. Can you buy me this? Can you do that? And I'm just like, oh boy. But she's my spoiled spoiled child until I have kids of my own. So um, I remember sitting her down in the ottoman in my room. I have my bedroom is quite large. I have an ottoman in my room, and I was on the bed, and I was just like, you know. you can't get anything you want from Amazon. Like we got to cut back on all of the spending because I'm going to leave my job. And she was like, what? And so my boyfriend at the time was supposed to put me on his health insurance, but his, cause we thought his job had like a domestic partnership thing, but they didn't. So then she was just like, what are you going to do for insurance? But I, at that time thought I was going to be on his insurance, which kind of made her feel a little bit better about the situation. 
And I was just like, I made a promise to myself when I left Goldman, if I ever was in a job that made me feel this kind of level of stress or whatever I was going through, I was just going to walk away from it because nothing is worth that look that my therapist gave me when I told him that I wanted to get hit by a bus, but not to die, you know, like, it was just like, are you crazy? Like that's insanity. Yes. And so when I felt like everything with my dad and my job was like kind of coming to that point, I made the decision. I saved my bonus payments. Like, you know, that was a blessing. I used to get monthly bonuses. I saved my bonus payments and I was just like, I'm out. And that having that faith turned into the blessing of in the UK, they call it a garden leave. So essentially I was at a position in my company where they didn't want me to go to a competitor. So they pay you not to work. Um, And so I got paid not to work. And that's how I started my entrepreneurial journey. Like my friends will tell you, my family may even tell you as a kid, my dad was an entrepreneur. So I would see the struggles of him having to collect rent, him, you know, tussles, all sorts of drama, you know, at the laundromat that he owned, at the apartment buildings, like it was always something. And I was just like, I'm not doing that. Like, Oh no, she dropped. Jen, where did you go? We lost her. Hold on a moment here. Well, while we're waiting for Jen to return, let's just give her a moment. I know, oh no, like it was, she was at a great point in the story. I'm sure she'll be right back with us. Again, we're talking with Jen Small about why existing is not enough. It's funny, she said her dad was an entrepreneur. I grew up with my dad being an entrepreneur. So I definitely have the experience of watching him go through the struggles of, you know, having to chase people around the back of the house. And I'm in the car just watching the person run out the back trying to get away so they don't have to pay the bill. Things of that nature. Okay, she's back. Hold on one moment. Let's add her to the stream. Apologies. I was getting a call and it kind of messed up the whole thing. So no, um, that happens. Definitely. So I put my phone on too, not just her. Uh, so either way. Um, so you were telling just, us about you were watching, you've been watching, you've watched your dad. Go I watched my couple. dad and, you know, he was retired at, in his 40s, right? So I saw the successes of it, but I also saw the tremendous amount of hard work and like, sacrifice and just struggle that came with that. And I was just like, why would I do that when I could work somewhere and like save my money and, you know, retire? And so I just never saw it for myself. But the thing is, I think when God knows you have talents, like he doesn't always let you see it. He lets other people see it. So someone tapped on me to be their business manager, um, which is funny. It's the first client that I, I was on, but the first client that I fired Uh, just because of like their behaviors and things about them that just didn't align with, you know, my ethics, my morals, just my life in general. Right. Um, And I was almost like killed um, because of like being around this person. Um, Mm -hmm. I had like a very traumatic situation happen to me in 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, So I say that to say that person taps on me to do it. And it just kind of like, you know, it was a, a, it was like the fire, you know, that just sparked something. Um, and then I went on to manage other clients, um, work with friends who are clients. Like, you know, I'm wearing this silk scarf. Shout out to R. Riles, um, one of my really good girlfriends who Beautiful is a designer. And- she probably got a call, but she said her scarf is from R. Riles. That's beautiful, definitely. Just one moment. Thank you all for your patience. (laughs) We have new connectivity issues, but that's how life works for you, definitely. Things happen. You just have to kind of roll with the punches, you know? It would be boring if it was just a straight line every day. Got to have the ups and the downs to truly appreciate.
I really appreciate <laughs> it might be her setup. Somebody said they're convinced it's your setup, Jen. <laughs> that I'm set up? No, that it's your setup over oh, there. Oh, no, no, no. It's not that. It's, it's, it's a bunch of other things. So uh, there's some work happening at my house right now and someone's trying to get a hold of me and I'm just like, I'm not home. I can't talk. And then there's another. What's my nickname for you, Jen? Busy Smalls. <laughs> Busy Smalls. So her phone just keeps ringing you all. She can't help I it. I put it on do not disturb, but I don't know how to get it on a continuous do not disturb. So the second time the person calls, they get through. So I'm sorry, everyone. But yes, busy is still busy, um, but made time for Tamika. Next time I have to do this from my computer, but my, my computer actually died. Uh, so that's a whole nother story. So no either way, appreciate thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. So I am. Um, I just didn't want to do it. Like, I was just like, why would I be an entrepreneur? Like, what would it does it make sense to me just because of like my experience. But my brother always said to me, like, our dad worked hard, not always smart. Right. And mm -hmm. so I think that was the thing is just like my uh, interpretation of entrepreneurship was very different to what it could be. Is it hard? Absolutely. It is. It's not a walk in the park. Like, I'm happy that I'm doing it part time now because there's just certain things um, for me, just my personality type, like that would be difficult for me to do it full time because I did it. I did it for two years. So right. essentially, I started off looking to be an insurance adjuster because I wanted some kind of work that was flexible. Um, and especially after what happened with my dad, like insurance adjusters can make like six figures, but they make their own schedule. Right. right. Yeah. And so that was my initial goal. And then COVID happened. So there was no test. I was studying. I couldn't study anymore. I just was like depressed. The whole world's just gone to, you know, caca. And I'm like, right. I'm over it. So uh, a friend who had introduced me to the insurance adjusting was just like, well, there's other things that are like essential worker that you could do. And so mm -hmm. I started doing like third party, like asset collateral ver verification for banks. So mm -hmm. I would be that person, like you took out a loan and the bank would send me to like take pictures of your apartment or your building or the asset. And that was interesting because I got to meet a lot of cool people, mm -hmm. um, got to drive around a lot, you know, when outside was closed and the highways, it was just very okay. enjoyable um, for a bit. And then that's when that person had tapped on me to be their manager. And I was just like, it was always a joke. Um, my friend, really good friend, her birthday tomorrow, Alisa, aka Mommy Trapper, um, she, we have a picture from college where someone was like, this is Alisa and her future manager, Jen. So there was always this joke that I should be someone's manager, right? Like I just always had that personality. I was always trying to connect the dots for folks. Um, and I did a lot of charity work, volunteer stuff. So when he reached out to me about managing him, I was just like, you know, this actually, like I could do that, right? Like yeah. I could do it. So that personality, that's so funny. Yeah, exactly. And that's also the joke because I'm my last name is small. People right. always think like I'm tall, like that is some kind of like, but I'm I'm five four. I'm, I had to admit yeah. to myself in the past few years that I'm not tall. In my mind, I always thought I was tall. But your I know personality is very big though. Thank you. Biggie small, busy small. Um, <laughs> so um uh I say that to say I took the leap, like took the faith, like I could do this. And then, you know, since I've, as I mentioned, I worked with Ashley, I right. worked with Avala, um, who's another woman who's popping up for my birthday on Sunday, um, countless other people. And even the first client that I had that I fired, mm -hmm. he even brought me to the last client that I worked with um, because I was in the oyster space. So people had known me now for like being able to kind of help, you know, correct uh, excuse me, connect revenue streams, doing mm -hmm. events, produ event production. Um, and so I helped this woman, Brittany, um, shout out to you. She has an amazing oyster truck called the Oyster Lever. So it's a food truck. So I basically, you know, got her information, put, connected the dots for her to start this business. And her husband actually is a uh, oyster farmer. So that's why I think it's like a cute story. Like he had the farm and now she's a lover because she has a food truck. And uh, so the lover? The Oyster Lover, yes, that's her Instagram, the Oyster Lover um, food truck, I want to say. Um, so yeah, you can Google the Oyster Lover food truck. Um, that's Brittany. She was one of my clients. 
shout out to John and Angie. I, um, the duality, I, as I mentioned, I was also an artist. So in college, I managed a woodworking studio and I really, really love uh, furniture as an art form because it's functional, but it's also creative. And I feel like that's just me as a person. Like I'm very much about function, very much about operations, improving processes, but I'm also an artist and I like nice things and I like the flair and yeah. furniture is that for me. Uh, so I wanted to, when I was stressed out at Goldman, I wanted to move to Italy. I was dating an Italian guy at the time. Like I was just like, oh, I'm just go to design school in Italy. I'll do my MFA. And then it quickly set in that even though I'm a British citizen and the tuition would be lower, I couldn't live the lifestyle that I wanted. So it was just like, I'm not going to live in a hostel. Like I've never did that kind of travel. I'm not that girl. Like I'm very much like a pamper me luxury type of person. So I was just like, yeah, actually, I'll just look for another job that I actually like. Right. Um, so I started working at a hedge fund and I liked that. And they actually, they moved me back to the States. And that's when I met John and Angie because a really good friend of mine, Will, who's also an artist, um, you know, multi-talented. He's also a professor. He said to me, people call me Smalls. He was like, Smalls, you don't need to go back to school to do woodworking. Like you can just take some classes. But in, when I lived in London, the classes thing wasn't like a big thing there at the time. Mm -hmm. So I met John and Angie. They have Vienne Echo, which is a millwork studio. So millwork, for those who don't know, is um, woodworking, so carpentry. But that's one of the terminologies that they call millwork. So John makes amazing like cabinetry. If you own a bar, he could do a custom setup, like, you know, all hand-drawn designs. Him and I have that in common. We don't really know how to use the computer-aided uh, design software. He draws everything and he'll give it off to someone who can do that. Um, mm -hmm. And so Angie is his wife. Um, and she then, I went from being their student to being their consultant, like helping her spin off the BN Echo Academy, where she helps high school students, people like you and I, who are have an interest in woodworking and want to take a class after school or mm -hmm. after work. They essentially have that, and it was a consolidated business, but I worked with her to spin that out into its own business. And now she has uh, works with Department of Education here in New York, and she like helps, uh, uh, takes on like student interns and like mentors uh, high school students uh, here in Brooklyn. So just the kind of like natural connections of working with folks turned into business opportunities for me. So mm -hmm. I created a website just for the sake of having a website but I literally never had to solicit a client. Drew Beckenberg is someone else whose business manager I was. Um, he made my friend's, Maida's husband's suit. I kept in touch with him because I love the suit. I love fashion. I yeah. wanted to be a fashion designer when I was younger, but then I was just like, eh, I don't, you know, I, let, let me focus on the math. And <laughs> so um, Drew then was one of my for my second client that I manage, you know, got him a collaboration with a fashion technology company. He produced, he produced a show in LA that we all flew out for. Um, so just the like amazingness of like referrals and references and people seeing what you do and thinking that you're good at it. It mm -hmm. just keeps the blessings coming. And did um, you notice that once you made, I mean, I heard it in your story, but did you notice at the time it was happening that as you made that shift from existing where you were in that anxiety riddled, you know, day to day to actually living, did you notice the shift? Did you notice the change? Um, yes, yes, or did definitely. You look like because it changed? no, no, no. I think I noticed it because I, I'm, I also like this. Like sounds a little weird sometimes when I say it, but I was actually tested. I have a very high emotional intelligence, so I do pick up on certain things. And so, yes, I did notice it because I had a period with entrepreneurial life where I was starting to exist. Like mm -hmm. I was just like, you know, having to create boundaries. And it's just like people always want to call me for advice. And it's just and it's one of those things where it's like I love to do that, but I have a mortgage to pay at the end of the day. Right. So I started to feel like I was just existing because it was just a constant drain of knowledge, constant drain of time you know, love Joy, my former assistant, she unfortunately had a cancer diagnosis. And then it was just like, I didn't have this buffer anymore. It was just like everything falls to the wall, Jen. And right. I was just like, you know what? I like being a part of a team. Right. I, that made me realize that. And then, you know, 
going to my um, job where I'm at work for like an institutional bank that has like a fintech arm, um, and I'm a senior relationship manager for them, that's when I realized like, oh, I, it was a pivotal conversation actually. So there's a woman named uh, Patricia Wedding. She's an entrepreneur as well. When I started my consulting company, she was one of the people who she interviewed me on her Facebook. Um, excuse me. She has a YouTube channel called um, Basel State NYC. Um, so Kisses from New York. And Patricia interviewed me. And it was amazing because I was able to talk about what I did. Like, you know, people always like, oh, what do you do? And I'm like, I made a joke. Like, I do whatever the client needs to succeed if it's legal. Right. So right. <laughs> that was like you know, we talked about like my whole background and everything. And I had a conversation with Patricia. I, I think it was Patricia who said, so what are you doing to like bring you joy? And I literally felt like a deer in headlights. Like it was just like, I was naked. Like, damn, I couldn't even answer that question. Like I was that stressed and like, like, you know, my mom had had back surgery last year. Like it was just so many concurrent things that were happening where I could tell that I was slipping into existing only. And that conversation was like the alarm bells went off. Like, Jen, you got to change something up. And that's when I started looking for a new job. I also, you know, transparently was dealing with a lawsuit. Um, unfortunately, like someone was suing me for defamation that was completely baseless. Um, but you still have to pay to defend yourself, right? So right. it's just like that was a whole thing as well. Um, so it was just like the existing was coming up and then I was just like having to really like channel like what do you like to do like what do you like to do for fun like I love to eat I would go out to dinner all the time but it's like that wasn't enough right and then I'm like you like to travel so the fact that I now have a job where it's hybrid where I do get to travel and mm -hmm. still work right it was just like, this is what I needed. Like everyone, I literally had like a rundown with my friends. Like I was just like to close out the, I think someone said it's 12 more weeks of 2020. Mm -hmm. And to close out the 12 weeks of 2020, it was just like, okay, I just came back from Dallas. I was in DC for work conference. I'm going to Austin. Then I'm going to, oh, excuse me, I skipped over Bermuda. Uh, shout out to Karee Luna. Um, she's doing an NFT conference in Bermuda this coming Thursday. So I'm going out there for that. So, excuse me. So it was Dallas, D.C., then Bermuda, then Austin, um, then Chicago for work, like my day work, and then um, Orlando to visit my siblings. So like literally like more than five places in 12 weeks to close out the year. And that's possible because I have a flexible work right exactly. and I don't feel stressed and I am a part of a team like for instance like today I wanted to take off but my boss his wife is going you know having some like health issues and I'm literally uh I work today because you know I needed to cover and but I'm there for him like I know he would be there for me and I think that's why I know being a part of a team is important just like at the small business suite so that's my other company mm -hmm. that I still run I co-founded with Erwin Shanae um, and myself, that was something I never wanted to sh shy away from doing because I had a team, right? Like Erwin mm -hmm. owns the lounge, there's employees, there's Ty, there's Danny, there's all of these people who we all come together. There's Kojo, there's a chef, like we make things together as a collective, right? And we make right. them work. When it's just you alone, and I think maybe that was my struggle with entrepreneurship of what I witnessed with my dad is like, doing everything alone is mm -hmm. a surefire way to burn yourself out. And exactly. I have no interest in doing that. And that's the existing and I want to live. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You have to have a team behind you. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. And building that team for consulting was just very, very difficult um, for me. So I'm, you know, I pivot like, you know, if there's a special project that can happen on the small business suite, I can take that on. Right. I have a team right. there. But I just don't personally want to just be like, oh, this is just my thing, unless like it's just a passion, thing, right? right. Um, which in some ways, even High Low Mafia, like I have Tatiana Dukes um, who's helping me with social media. So even though I just started this other business idea, which essentially is like a community of people who like luxury things like myself, but also are budget conscious, um, follow at the, excuse me, at High Low Mafia on Instagram. Um, I still already have made a team around that because I don't, I'm passionate about it. So I don't want it to burn me out. 
And so that's why I have Tatiana helping me with social media and other projects so that I'm, I'm focused on having a team. I'm intentional about having a team so that and I don't that get the strategic planning and development that you gained from corporate America, from that experience you have in corporate America. Like Absolutely. you have to have that balance in all honesty, it seems, in order to be truly successful, you know? Yes, yeah. I personally see it. I think about some of the other successful business owners. I know like Vinny's, there's a clothing store downtown Brooklyn. It's three brothers. They're a team, right? Erwin had a business partner at one point. He's solely mostly the business now, but he has a team of employees. Like having a team for me, and there's people who do it on their own, absolutely, right? But even my friends, like we support each other as teams. Like Mommy yeah. Trapper, you know, I'm helping to tape a music video um, yeah. on an iPhone. You know, my friend Shelly, she caters, like we're decorating, like, you know, and you got to pay your team. So yeah. we're all friends and we do business together. We got Chanel of We and Me Designs, like, um, you know, that's her and her daughter's company. Like, we all do things. Can't forget Shanae, she's my business partner, her collectively. We all do things collectively. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like her collectively, Shanae's company's name is the epitome of my family. Um, mm -hmm. And I say family because we're friends, but we're really family at this point. And even my own family, like, my cousin has a decorating business as well. Her and my friend Shelly partner together sometimes, like, I'm helping my cousin do events. I hire my cousin to do events. I hire Shelly to do events. Like we all, you know, if you're a part of my network, you know that I'm rooting for you in the places where you may not even be, you know? Right. Um, that's exactly. how I am. And that's my mother and me. Like my mother, like that's a joke. There's a VIP section in heaven for Sheila. Like my mother would give you the shirt off her back. She's that type of person. I'm not, maybe not as nice as her, but I'm nice. You know, <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. I mean, but the truth be told, like that is exactly what we were talking about, even when we first met about how nurturing the light in you automatically makes you nurture the light in others. And so yeah. you do. I mean, when we met, even we were, you know, you were, we oh, were yeah. out for one another. It wasn't like, you know, hey, we met literally you? because Mika overheard a conversation and then I started having a conversation with her because she acknowledged what she overheard and it then next thing you know what energy. five minutes later i'm like okay we have to go because we're only here for this amount of time like we're just yeah. connected you know exactly and then i was in dc for work and i was they had the pleasure of having brunch with her with another friend who came over for lunch from london for the imf conference another finance friend yeah. like completely separate universes but all still you know we all have a professional side to us like nika has a day job as well like She's a corporate, um, excuse me, corporate she's a corporate recruiter, HR. Yeah. Yes, corporate recruiter. So it's like, don't let people put you in a box. Like when I was telling people that I wanted to kind of step away from being a full-time entrepreneur, I had those people who were like, oh, no, you're good at it. Like, you just got to figure this out. No, I don't have to figure anything out. I got to do what's best for me. I want to live. I'm existing right now. I can feel it. I know when that shift is happening. Mm -hmm. And so I have to spring into action to make sure that I don't let it like consume me. And know? that's the big kicker that it happens more than once in your life. Oh, you it's multiple. At this find point. yourself existing once and okay, you shifted into living and that's it. You're going to live. You're going to, this is what you're going to do every day. Things ever. always come up, but the things come yeah. up before the blessings. Like, and yes. I, I think that's the, the having the faith, like a lot of times, any of those like trials and tribulations, always a huge blessing that came after it, right? Yeah. Like, always, even like the whole lawsuit thing. The blessing is that I now have a flexible job that I get to enjoy, do the things that make me happy. Like I still get to do my pop-up on the weekends. I still get right. to, you know, travel. I still get to go out to dinner. I get to, I get to live like, yeah. and my job created the living for me right now, right? It helped mm -hmm. me get out of the just existing because the, the not having the team it's like money always comes. Like the job is great for consistent money, but the money will always meet. I'm like, I'm fortunate that I've never had to want for much, right? It's gonna come but it's the that. team. The money could be there, but without the team, it doesn't even feel the same. Right. So that's, that was my current, you know, story. Just literally this past year, like I'm talking about like, I think March is when I started to notice like something's not right. Like something's feeling off. And it was just like, I need to sit down and, evaluate 
what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And here we are talking. I met you at CultureCon. I have to say shout out to George Myrie at Silin, S T U Y. U-Y-L-I-N. Um, he gave me my ticket to go to CultureCon, and that's how I met Mika. Um, and I met countless other, you know, amazing entrepreneurs, you know, full-time, part-time. You have to do what makes sense for you. Don't yeah, let exactly. put you in a box. Yeah. And so, but wait, I want to be conscious of your time because I know you- Yes, I do. I was going to say, I didn't want to cut you up, but I do. Like, what's your, what's your, you know, closing thoughts? What's on your heart? Last what's on thing? my heart? Yes, to I think I just you. said it. Like, don't let, don't let people put baby in a corner. Do not let anyone put you in a box. You do what makes you happy. Don't feel like you're gonna don't. And even if you are judged, don't worry about the judgment. Like, because as um, <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I'm like, I don't, I don't curse because my mom is like very much like you know like you oh you can't say certain things. But it's like what you eat doesn't make me shit right. Mm -hmm. So you can have your feelings about whatever you think is right for me, but I'm going to do what I think is right for me, right? Yeah. And I think that's the thing. So many people live in this space of wanting to have approval from their family and from this person and their job and that. I went into the job like, hey, I got, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I do have an outside activity. I didn't lead with that in the interview, but like I was very transparent about like, I do run another thing, but I automated that thing. Cause like you said, the professional experience, I took it from us getting payments on Zelle and cash and cash app to literally, you need to go to a website, you have to book, you're going to get a text reminder. That's a gem small operations professional who bring, who br wears that hat in the entrepreneurial life. Right? So mm -hmm. that is where like my whole team benefits because Things aren't as chaotic as they may have been. Like, you know, it's on the calendar, it's a text that people know, like there's there's more communication, it's it's tighter. And it it I think the, the last thing I'll close with is be okay with iterations. Like everything doesn't need to be perfect the first time. I made the High Low Mafia um, logo in 10 minutes three weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. Our reach in two weeks has already hit like over 2,000 accounts which is something that accounts that have 10,000 followers sometimes have that on a, on a monthly average, right? right? So even though you may not see the likes or whatever, you can see the analytics. And so I let go of this, like trying to be perfect and mm -hmm. just doing it and just getting it done, messy, dirty, however it has to get done, just do it and stop holding on to this. Like, and I know as an artist, like we can be in our heads They'd be like, oh, is anybody going to like this? But there's no way you'll know, bless me, God. there's no way you'll know what somebody likes or doesn't like unless you do it. And that's that's my advice to everyone. That's what I'll close with. Like, just know that it doesn't have to be right the first time. Like, we all live in iterations. Like, someone, it's another artist, like her name is um, Nikki, um, Nikki B. She posted, like, the light, like, a 10-year span of, like, all these luxury brands, like their logos, like Versace, like, you know, all these different logos they had, or Nike had all these different logos. And it's just like, they just did it, right? Yeah. They weren't like caught up in the, oh, this isn't, this isn't great. This isn't good. Like, if you don't do it, you'll never know, right? Yeah. And, and that, that's where I'm at. Thank you so much. And wait, um, so everybody, thank you for tuning in. Please check out the High Low Mafia on thank you. Instagram. Yeah. Please check out Lavish Con Shop at Lavish. Shop um, Lavish Bars and Lavish Conversations. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, Lavish Conversations, if you haven't. And make sure that you get out here and live because there's no point in you just being out here existing. Because if you don't pour into enough. the light in you, you do a disservice to the light in everybody else. Make sure you make your self-care a requirement today because you are not an option. And I look forward to seeing you for our next Lavish Conversation. Thank you so much again, Jen, for joining us. Thanks, Mika. I appreciate you. Yes, yes you as well. well. Thank you for having me on your platform. I appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us again. All right, cheers. Oh, wait. Whoever said for you not to charge what you priced as, don't listen to them. You always charge what you are worth, okay? You might not be everybody's cup of tea, but you don't want everybody out here drinking out of you, do you? <laughs>